Greetings, flesh creatures. It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collective podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons! Terrorize! All right, everybody. Good evening and welcome to TFYLP episode 7396-.42. Uh, happy Pi Day. Uh, we are doing a pre-record, so we're not live. Um, unfortunately, after some of Zaldron's comments, uh, we have to uh, fix some issues with the chat. Um, uh, not really true. It's actually on me. I have some technical issues when I try to stream live. So we're trying to minimize that by doing a pre-record. Um, so tonight I am joined by Anna. Good evening. And Catherine. Hello. And Ricky Ricardo. You know, the way you said, thanks to Zoldron's comments, we have to fix something. It made me think, what did this dude say that we have to go back and fix something? That what inappropriate con- typical Zaldron? Typical Zaldron. He say that we have to go back and fix things. Zaldron uh, was at a different convention this past weekend. Yeah, he some pretty cool folks out there. He went to a I convention to... with an estimated hundred thousand people at it. I yeah. think we yeah. won. Which I used which, to think I mean, Zaldron. Seeing the people who we got to meet, I can see why it had a hundred thousand people. That was uh, yeah, some cool folks he got to meet. Yeah, I used to think Zaldron was like catfishing us, like it was probably just Duran or something. Uh, but no, I met him. He's a real person. He is. Yeah, I could have told you he was a real person from the beginning. I've known him since I joined. Okay. Well, but tonight we're instead going to talk about TFCon LA, which is importantly b- brought to us by our proud sponsors, Kiss Players. <laughs> there. Cat, Cat, I'm so excited. What what have you been on the show? Two years, three years now, and this is our first time together on the show. It is. It is. I'm very excited for that. I'm very. I can already tell. I don't like you. Oh. Um. Good to I see you too. Th- Despite the fact that I'm trying to minimize uh, uh, technical issues, my wife and son are practicing martial arts above me, so you might hear them bouncing around on the floor. Nice. I yeah. like it. It's not a, not a joke. They, they really are. So uh, what are we discussing tonight? We're discussing TFCon. Was that? That's coming up in uh, July. This was TFCon Los Angeles, Rick, and, and I think you might still have jet lag because you were there. And Anna was there, and Catherine was there, and I wasn't there. So I'll ask you guys questions, and hopefully that will induce some great conversation about the what hopefully was a fun time for all. Yeah. What really impresses me about TFCon is when it became three cons every year, I really questioned if that was a good idea. I remember thinking, okay, can TFCon really handle three conventions a year that are all relatively big, for the same little niche fandom that we are all at once every year and everyone I attend since I first made that mental comment is just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. I feel like the attendance is always out of control TFCon, more so than it was last time. TFCon is a well-oiled machine. Absolutely. They know how to, they know what they're doing. They know the staff is always the same staff, uh, show after show. They know, all right, we're doing the Welker Cullen pictures. This is how people are lining up. They got a table. Hey, you're going to go up to get your picture. Here's a table for you to put your stuff down. Go over here, take a picture. In the meantime, someone's moving your stuff to the, to the exit. Here's your stuff back out the door. Next person comes in. Uh, very smooth. Very smooth. Remember back in the day, now ladies, you, you two of you might be too young for this, but back in the day, there there was a man 
who nowadays I, I we refer to him as he who shall not be named. Uh, let's just say his name rhymes with Lucas he, Hen Glallet, and he wanted Subtle. to do. Uh, he had a weird name for his conventions. Oh fuck. He wanted to do official Transformers collectors conventions, and he wanted to do three a year plus one in Europe, uh, and then do little micro events uh, all all over the country. And uh, it didn't work out for for Mister Flynn Gallet. So uh, I'm glad to see that it's working well for TFCon. Uh, it's it's smoother. Then I dare I dare say any any Brian Savage fun publication event worked many a fun publication event as staff and behind the scenes guy they've got it down to a science and uh, they do you know they deserve all the success they get. Yeah, I heard that. It's a very cleanly run convention. Everything, things are on time, which if you're a convention goer, like like I am, I've gone to many, many conventions in my life. Most conventions, things are not on time. Most conventions, especially the big, like, celebrity events are always running late by some proportion of time. It can be up to hours, depending on how how poorly put together things are. But TFCon isn't like that. Things are on time. Things are efficient. Panels run for exactly how long they're supposed to. It's a very clean event. Yes. And what I like is, so LA is always the biggest of all the shows. Uh, because, I, I mean, there's a huge population of people in LA. But also so many celebrities live out, out in LA that they can have a ton of guests. So at, in the back wall of where the convention actually is held, at the Marriott, there's uh, um, there's pipe and draping, and there's tables set up for for everybody, and every guest has a person there, at least one, sometimes two, to help with uh, changing the money, with taking pictures, with getting stuff ready to get signed for people, and on clockwork, somebody comes in, they escort the guest out, they take the banner down, they put up the next banner, and the next guest comes out. Yeah, that means a lot with how many guests they have, right? They have a lot of staff yeah, and a I, lot of guests. I think Colin is still announcing guests that were at the show that he, he didn't get a chance to announce. <laughs> so, I mean, Rick, you're joking, but it was literally like day of the show. They had announcements on their social media of voice actors who were going to be there from Generation 1. Yes, yeah, and... Uh, there's people there that, you, you know, it was their first convention. And uh, there were people there who I didn't know were even available for signing. And I, excuse me, I, I do forget the actor's name. But the person who uh, played Daniel in the original animated film, he was at the convention. And I, I never thought... I, I, I've... I've been taking this Transformers movie poster around the convention for about 20 years, getting it signed by various people. And I have some pretty special signatures on it and some really great memories of getting those signatures. So one signature is Nelson Shin, the director. I don't know many people who have ever met Nelson Shin, but I got to produce the 15th anniversary DVD and, uh, I helped him with the commentary and he was there and he, he signed my poster. Peter Cullen signed David Mendenhall. David Mendenhall. Thank you. And he, what's weird is he kind of looks like a grown up Daniel. So, uh, Peter Cullen, even though I'd met him a bunch of times, I never had the poster there for him to sign. One day at Hasbro, he comes into my office and he signs my poster in my office. And finally, I got my wife. An experience we've all had. Yeah. Uh, as one typically does. Yeah. 
a Tuesday. And then, uh, yeah, it was, well, I think it was a Wednesday. So, I got David Mendehall, who I never thought I'd ever have a chance to sign. Uh, I got four signatures this weekend on that poster. And the last signature that I got was Frank Welker. And that was, that was my white whale. And I, t- I told him that, and he, he cracked up at it. You know, even though we, we had worked together on Transformers Prime, uh, it just never worked out. And he was the last signature. And now that poster can rest. I have the frame ready to go at my store. And in the next couple of days, I will frame said poster and hang it up in my, my toy shop. Opening March 30th has been Toys and Comics. And I can move on to the next thing, the next stage of my life. You're finally done collecting. Congratulations. I didn't say that. You can retire. I didn't say that. Uh, but I can, I can finally stop worrying about it because I think I got everybody who's still with us now. Um, That's we're cool. We're going to have a seance for Orson Welles. Yeah, well, as I said, everyone who's still with us. Yeah, the crowd of celebrities was imp- impressive, as always. Obviously, I mean, being the 40th anniversary year, this, this year was much more than normal. But there were, if you looked, there were, even, there were even celebs in the crowd as attendees. Yeah, such as? Kirkman. Such as? Robert Kirkman was there, yes. Mm-hmm. Of the Walking Dead. Which and is really fame. cool. Because a lot of people have been kind of like on the sideline commenting on how having Kirkman in charge of a Transformers run in charge of the Energon universe is a little bit strange because I kind of question like, are these guys really like super fans like our last showrunners were for the comics? And now, you know, he made the effort to go to the biggest unofficial Transformers con, which means that he's trying to, you know, actually... Um, what is the word? Connect. Um, yeah, Connect immerse, the immerse himself with the fans. Yes, he's doing immersion, which is good because that will make him a better. That'll make him a better creator, universe runner. Right. Yeah, so that, it was really cool to hear that he was there. I, I didn't see him because I wouldn't have known what he looked like. Um, so I didn't see him when he was there. But when people were talking about it, I was like, oh, that's really good. Rick, did you or Catherine see him? Just pictures. Yeah, I just saw the pictures. I uh, I really want to see, and I know a guy who, uh, you know, my buddy EJ, Sue, who's a great artist, works for him. And uh, EJ's done a Transformers cover, but he's also done a lot of work on Invincible. And I keep wanting to, like, find a way to connect with him so I can pitch to him. I, I know they're not ready for this in their, in their universe, but I, I kind of want to do... See if there's any interest in Transformers Prime season three, Rick's Way, right? <laughs> or what was the show after season three of Prime? Or Transformers Animated season four? You know, like what? Or maybe doing something completely crazy and writing a story for no reason whatsoever that wraps up the Dreamwave universe. I'm going to love when your ideas get scrapped and Anna and Catherine's Transformers robot novel uh, gets made first. What's going to happen is he's going to agree to do it. And then he's like, all right, but you got to make Optimus green. (laughs) At which point fights will be had. I'm going to slide in front of you while you're trying to pitch. I'm going to be like, hey, guess what I got? Kids Player Season 3. Nice. I'm going to pitch to him. He's going to be like, that's the best idea I've ever heard, Doctor. Here you go. You're going to be like... He will acknowledge. He will acknowledge my education level. Can I interest you in a character named Rosanna? That's right. See, we we share... My name is part of her name, so therefore, he'll be convinced by that. Yes. That's what's going to do it. That's what's going to do it. It is. My- it is what's going to do it. And I will finally get my my next season of Kids Plays. I will not call it the final season because it will just be the next one. 
Because then it will become perennial. It'll run longer. It'll run longer than One Piece. It's right. going to be an amazingly long right. series. Right. Right. So let's come back to Rosanna a little bit later. But but um, <laughs> so let's talk chronologically. Like so, Friday night was the kickoff of the show, and the kickoff of the convention. Like the show floor isn't open, but but you know dealers are getting their stuff set up. You know, friends are, are meeting each other and hanging out. And, and there's the first couple panels. And do we know anyone that was on any panels Friday? Well, I like to kick off the show on Fridays when I attend. I love that Friday night spot because the energy is good. And I come in there like a banshee on acid. And I like to get people going. And uh, this time, instead of doing a panel, uh, I did something... Um, What's the word? Uh, not what I am, selfish, but um, for somebody else, when you help somebody Altruistic. else, you're not helping yourself. Yeah, say that again. Altruistic. R- right, yeah. yeah. The whole lecture Ma- and how that doesn't exist in my social psychology class. Altruism yeah, Ma- is why we tell ourselves to feel better. Yeah, Ma- malnutristic. Yeah, that thing. So, uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Mr. Bill Forrester, who is, uh, I, I call him a hero of the fandom. And the reason I say that is because he, like other people, like Jim Sorensen, have brought information to the fandom. Behind the scenes stuff, stuff they didn't know, filling out details in fun ways. And that, to me, is a hero of the fandom. And so uh, he is uh, afflicted with a, a certain condition right now, um, early onset Parkinson's. And I saw him this weekend. I, I, I barely recognized him. But he's su- he is such a wonderful human being. Uh, Jim Sorensen and I put together a, uh, an auction to benefit him. And there were a lot of great donations from people. Uh, we had a couple of Robosin. We had uh, tons of original art. Uh, I donated a few uh, items. And I donated a sealed uh, Masterpiece Megatron and a piece of art from my frame shop. And together, we were able to raise uh, over $10,000 for Bill. And uh, that, that all went to him. And just to show you the type of person he is, I said, hey, do you want me to do another uh, benefit at, you know, TFCon in November? And he's like, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't ask the fans to ever do this again. Uh, so uh, for those of you who do want to still maybe donate to, to Mr. Forrester, uh, you, you still can. Uh, Check out uh, my Twitter or uh, probably uh, Jim Sorensen's Twitter, and you can find links to how to do that. Yeah, I remember looking at, the, uh, looking at the items. It was a very nice-looking auction. There were a lot of really cool items in there. Yeah, the energy is so great Friday night. And then, uh, well, if we can skip ahead a little bit to Sunday, I did, a, I did another panel. Can I just make a comment real fast? I just, I just want to establish something here. Phil was like, let's go chronological from the beginning of the convention. Yeah. And he was like, someone here was on a panel. Right, right. But I'm talking. He was you, clearly I, trying. Sorry, I know you were on a panel, Anna, but this is my time. All right. I didn't realize this was the Rick show. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll make a new graphic. I'll change up the MLP for Rick show. It's. It's TFYLP Rick's way. TFYL Rick? You, you are, Anna, you are completely correct, as usual. Uh, Phil did want to go chronologically, and I, I, for a second there, forgot that you were on a panel. And there was something very exciting that happened on that panel. Or rather, about <laughs> that panel. It was pretty panel. easy to forget. <laughs> so, please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, I mean, I don't have a whole ton to say about it. I, when we had Mike on the show last week, um, he made a light invitation for me to join the podcasters roundtable, 
which was basically me with a bunch of people who are actually famous in the fandom um, at a table of about 11 of us. <laughs> You're famous to me. I appreciate it. Answering questions from the fans. Um, a lot of the a lot of the questions were, as you would say, very softball questions. Like, who's your favorite Transformer? What's your favorite ride? Who's your favorite Optimus Prime? Whatever. A They're lot of them questions. were very specific. Yes, they were. They were the type of questions that strong personalities could play very well with and give very strong answers to. What's cool is that panel was in fact recorded. Mike has shared it on the internet in multiple places. I'm sure if you go to his socials, you can find it um, and watch it if you want to. I spoke up about four times. I was kind of the the, the lightest personality in the group, I think, which is okay. Um, but it was fun. I enjoyed but doing it. I would like to do it again. What was the big thing that we talked about, about that panel? When you got off the panel, we were all excited about it that I wasn't the only woman on the panel was that it yes I was very excited for that yeah because you don't see I mean other I've had people joke before that you know a lot of the other Transformers podcasts don't have any women on them whatsoever ours is two and um it was really nice to see that there was there was diversity on the panel, right? There was actually a good amount of gender and racial diversity on the panel. So that was that was something I didn't really expect and something that made me very happy um to see that because I think the fandom is definitely definitely becoming more diverse over the years. And I think that panel looked a little more like the attendees and that made me happy. LA does a really good job at reflecting that diversity. And that makes me really glad because I just, I feel like, I think it's really important to have people that your audience can connect to. And when your audience is diverse. That's a mirror of the audience. Yeah. It's a lot better that way. Yeah. They, they know it as well as the audience does. Some, sometimes certain, maybe a creator or an actor may not know all the little, you know, details that the fan knows, but up there you're, you're talking to people just like you. Yeah, I think that was good. I think that was good. Looking at the audience, I saw an audience that was as diverse as we were up there. That was cool. And it was a, it was a really nice, it was a nice event to be at. Like I said, it was there were a lot of us up there. You know, perhaps it was really good that we had more than one woman up there, but perhaps there were too many of us up there total. But that was okay. It worked out. Uh I think it really helps when you have a convention in a state that doesn't try to outlaw uh, certain groups of folks. So that that will likely help the diversity that, that is showing up at a convention. Geez, somehow TFCon LA felt more comfortable than TFCon Florida for that reason. I don't know why. Yeah, the humidity. There are a couple friends <laughs> I missed at TFCon Florida. They didn't go. I don't blame them. A lot of people didn't go for... for Strong reasons. So, not to go. Uh, but Catherine. we're not talking about that. We're talking about the good con that we were just at. So, uh, Catherine, uh, speaking of panels, did you attend any panels and did you have a, a favorite, if so? I did not attend really any panels. I I, I really circle the circle the dealer's room like a, like a death spiral of ants. Other than the third party panel, I hit that one. You know, I completely so forgot about it. I this think is... we're going in chronological order here. So how did you all sleep? <laughs> Thank you. So Silly we... happened before sleep, though. If before we're going to go in chronological order, the very yeah. first thing is well, the Well, first there was dinner, Phil. And, the, and, then oh, we, yeah. and then we went to sleep. And the well, custom... that Catherine tried to say. Thank you, Anna. The very first thing in the on the convention was the custom class. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And while none of us attended the custom class, somebody did pick up the kit. Yes, I did get the kit. And if I had it here, it's on my kitchen table, unfortunately. I have it. I'm probably not going to put together for a while for various reasons. You know, this my shelves are kind of bare because I'm kind of unpacking. So I may not do a custom in the middle of all that. But it's freaking turning 
um, turning the Voyager Tigatron into freaking Skeletor. And it's so cool. Uh, I picked up a cat cat kit for my friend. Um, I didn't think I was able to buy a kit because I didn't attend the, the show. And even though I really wanted it, my buddy's in Florida and he couldn't leave. He couldn't go to the show. So I thought, all right, let me let me get it for him. Uh, and so I got a I got a kit as well. Uh, very affordable. Yeah, the kit was pretty affordable and um they sold the so you know the custom class tickets are eighty dollars typically and it's kind of a it's high risk, right? Because if it's something you don't like, you're gonna feel like you wasted your money. Especially the year that it was a model kit, mm -hmm. me, Catherine, and our other friend all signed up for it, and none of us were happy about it. Um, I still have mine. I finished mine at home, but I still wasn't exactly thrilled about it. Now, this one was a win, right? Like, if you paid $80 to get, you know, the figure, the kit, and all the paints and materials, and people to help you do it, and sitting around the table doing it with the right people is really fun. In fact, that happening is why I'm on this show because um local friend of Lucas and mine, Sean, who's been on the show a few times in the past, he's the person I sat beside my first TF con to do a custom together. And because I met Sean and we talked for eight hours of painting and deconstructing and reconstructing, he ended up introducing me to Lucas, which ended up getting me to Expo, which ended up getting me eventually here. So I think it's a really cool opportunity if you find the right people to sit by. But if you end up sitting by yourself quiet, it's not very much fun. Anyway, they have more recently been selling the kits after. And this time they were selling the kit with a Tigertron for 60 or just the kit for 20 which I think you'll probably be able to find it online after. Usually you can for a little bit. Um, and yeah, um, I picked up the kit and then I found a used Tigatron at a table for cheap so a lot of people are ditching their Tigatrons so so yeah so Catherine, thank you for reminding me of that like they I feel like they announced that custom figure pretty late in, in terms did. of that like it was like what the day before the show started well do they do they announce the figure beforehand I typically just the day, day or, or day or two just the week of. Yeah. So by okay. the time they announce it, it's been sold out for long ago. Yeah. Then after the customization class and before the panels began, there's one final event. And that's when just the cool kids get to go and get their premiums. All the exclu all the, the special wonderful exclusives go for sale. Do, did you want to wait till later to talk about the exclusives? No, let's talk about Rosanna. We said we'd come back to Rosanna. Well, let's let's come back to Rosanna. What, one, and thing, one thing that I, I like to do is walk up and down the the hallway where people are waiting to buy their exclusives and yell out, they're sold out. So Catherine and I follow behind him and everyone who looked concerned because we were watching their faces melt. We were like, no, no, he's kidding. He's lying. He's just a jokester. There's still plenty. Don't worry. We were trying to be kind and save these poor souls <laughs> from the status inflicted by Monster Rick. He doesn't just smell like a troll, folks. He also behaves like <laughs> Yes, and look like Me one. Bouncing, bouncing around uh, excitedly for the last week or two because this was one of the exclusives. We have Rosanna, the most famous transformer ever because she is in fact a pop star um from kiss players being made in the mmc tape mold um this is the same mold they use for eject and rewind they did rosanna and flip sides which are two characters that don't really go together other than they're both women made off of the mold um but it was so cool because it was like you know a me um particular exclusive you know a kids players character and they did two women character exclusives um at the same time they were not cheap to get but they were they were very gettable right they didn't sell out fast or anything like that 
and they're super cool. They're super well made, of course. They're the MMC Rewind and Eject mold, which is one of my favorite um, MMC molds. And yeah, so happy to get these. I, I did get both of them. Um, I only have a few things out right now, but it was really cool to get them. And they were one, they were two of honestly. Once you get into the exclusives room, there were so many options, right? They not only had these two, they also had the Steel Jaw repainted as the Black Lion from a couple of cons ago, um, which was nice for people who wanted that mold. I think that mold is a pain in the butt, but it was there. Um, there were a few other of the older MMC tapes there. And they had the fans hobby exclusives, which I think none of us got. I I not being at the show did take up uh the chosen prime sale of Wingman and ordered you got it? his yeah. I, I haven't received it yet, but I ordered his Magenta Majesty uh yesterday morning. It's a pretty toy. Is a very pretty toy. I got to see it in person a lot this weekend. A lot of the boxes, a lot of people opening theirs. It is very pretty. Um, if you're if you listen to the show regularly, you've heard me complain about the mold itself that was used for Hydra. Um, it is it is a very finicky mold to handle. It is a very good looking mold, but if you mess with your toys a lot, it'll drive you crazy. If you don't mess with your toys, it'll be great. And it is gorgeous. The the bright colors are really cool. Speaking of bright colors. Lots of magenta and pink this year. Speaking of bright colors, the third exclusive was the introduction of the Colorverse. Woo, from Make Toys. It, the MCU finally has competition. And they gave us, yeah. they gave us two, uh, two different seekers in, the, in those in those strange colored molds there was paul and tangerine yeah it was tangerine swarm tangerine swarm. yes kind of a it was kind of a g2 star scream looking guy but a little bit different right and paul was the generic clone seeker yeah he's the same color scheme as from the four pack this year the hasbro um troop builder pack so those are Gosh, that made Toy Seeker, right? That thing has run. It has been put through the rainer. It, they have made so many figures off of that. And now this uh, announcer pretty much says, we're not going to stop, right? We're going to keep going. And it's been kind of a joke in the various groups to joke about, you know, oh, the exclusive sold really well, except for the color verse, because it looked like there was still a lot of stock of those. One notable thing about you know, those is unlike all the other Make Toy Seekers, they're packaging them different. They're packaging them in a clear rectangular box with the figure and robot mode standing in the center. So it's kind of already, just, but that makes it enormous. Lucas was joking last time about how big that um, plastic um, container for the G2 Starscream they did years ago was because it was just so oversized and enormous. This thing's freaking bigger. This box is just enormous and has the guy standing there. Not luggage friendly for those of us who travel to get to conventions. Yeah, I think by the end of the convention, uh, there were still plenty of the Colorverse figures left. A uh, fair amount of man left. But Rosanna and Flipsides were pretty close to sold out. I only saw one or two of those left near the end. I mean, they sold out so hard, the banners even sold. They did. Who, who, who got, got the banners? Do we, do we know who got? Oh, oh, some of our cast got the banners. Well, that's amazing. You know, uh, I'm, I'm... Catherine, do you mind sharing? Is this like an oop for the, uh, like, in terms of the cost of the banner? The price was, oof, it was pretty steep. It cost us a mighty $10. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that's awesome. American, 10 American. Yeah, that's like 50 Canadian. It cost them like way more than like the, what is that gonna be, Rick? You you deal somewhat tangentially in that space. How much does it cost to print something like that? Oh, I don't know. I uh, more than ten dollars. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Um. So that's you know, awesome. I was yeah. I was thinking as we were sitting here reminiscing about. Not sure if you can see mine. It's on the wall behind me. 
Yeah, I was I was thinking that uh, about those seekers. I think there's potential for uh, maybe those seekers to be done as uh, you know the target dog deco next year. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, if, tough. You think? Talk about disappointing exclusives. Oh, that's for another show. It is for another show. We do know that now that they've done flip sides and Rosanna, and they have already done Glit, so they're certain to do Condor next. Condor. And what color is Condor? So, because I don't have faith in anything, I went ahead and got the only other Sundor that's ever been. Sundor, I <laughs> hey, I worked on that one. The data is Sundor. Yeah, I hadn't. I just could not find him for a price I wanted to pay for him because it was always bundled with the blaster and possibly the sound wave too. And I ended up in like this well priced but expensive bundle of things I didn't want. I just found a little baggie with him and a few more of the data disc guys in it for a decent price. So I have a Sundor just in case we never get an MMC one. I do want an MMC Sundor. I hope they go ahead and do it. But they haven't made a new bird in a long time. Uh, what if they did him, but because their rat bat's about to come out, they just did him as rat bat, which would just be ween thing, right? If they did him in orange. Yeah, what I was just thinking. But they gave him a bird's head. It just looks like this horrible monstrosity. <sighs> yeah. So the only thing they didn't do on Friday, which was a, in fact, it's pretty much the only negative of the con. They didn't put up the bulletin board. True. No bulletin board. That was an unusual move and a first. And we asked about it and they were like, we're not putting that up until tomorrow. Now, I I imagine Mm. that some industrious fan probably could have countered that, probably could have put up their own bulletin board. Or just like if one person would have taped one of their flyers on the wall, then more people would have just taped it beside them and made their own bulletin board, but no one was at defiance. So there just wasn't a room party culture on Friday night. Or spoilers Saturday night either, really. But that was and okay. Nobody had post-it note technology. No, we didn't go through all the exclusives. Because that was just the that was just a couple of the exclusives. They also had the premiere of the three zero cartoon paint jobs on the three zero figures, which was really fun last week on the Hasbro stream because they were like, these figures are about to premiere somewhere mysteriously. Cause they didn't mention TFCon because they're not gonna promote TFCon on a Hasbro stream. But three zero, they had a huge ass booth and they were there to promote their stuff. So they had those in the exclusive room. If you wanted to get a hold of the exclusive G1 cartoon color versions of their 3.0 and DLX line. Which I did. And speaking as someone who has all the 3.0 figures except for one with the gold Optimus. um, Yeah, I've never opened a single one of those things. Yeah, I have Uh, the Bumblebee. Unlike Eric, I don't have all of them. I just have Bumblebee and he's open. Yeah, one day I'll I'll get around to it. I just um, yeah, I'm sorry. There's just no time for me to open them. They're very so, good. I hope so. I I've spent a lot of money on them. So I hope they're, they're good. high end. They're very nice figures. I you know they made a G2 Megatron, and that's that's all I care about. I love G2. So um, yeah, mine gets here on Saturday. My G2 Megatron. I'm looking forward to that. I'm tempted to get the uh, Marvel Comics paint scheme one. With the, like, dark gray, almost black helmet. Oh, yeah, yeah. They did that one, too. Mm. So, any, uh, no room parties, any fun uh, nightlife stories going on there? Well, um, we kind of had a culinary adventure. So, when you barely survived. I know I was breathing pretty heavy. Uh so I I am a man of the world and I like to travel on my stomach. But I had never had uh Del Taco ever. 
And so I've been to California a million times, never stopped at a Del Taco. We finally went to Del Taco and I, without getting too off topic, uh, the, the meat was a little bland, wasn't as greasy as I had hoped for. You know, Taco Bell has that, you know, juice in it, that orange fatty grease. Uh, flavor profile wasn't that salty and the portions were quite small. However, I did steal some of Catherine's French fries and they were probably the best thing I ate the whole weekend. Del Taco doesn't use as much sawdust in their meat. Yeah, you you could I think I was missing the flavor of cat. That's what. Like kittens. So you're saying Del Taco is allowed to call it meat. Yeah, yeah. So Del Taco Del Taco uh, I give it a 24 on the Rick scale, which goes from uh, I, 1 to 83. I found it funny that out of our group, which was two Californians, Mr. World Traveler of Eating, and me, some poor kid from St. Louis, I was the only one who had ever had Del Taco in the group because we used to have a del taco in st louis back in the day um it was run down and not very nice but it was there so i had had del taco before and i think rick's summary of it was pretty accurate thank, yes thank you thank you it was fine it, it's and, it's fine and then we we also had denny's <laughs> You were some world travelers this weekend. Diddy's and Del Taco. Really pitching the highlights there, Rick. Yes. Yeah. We had Denny's. So Saturday. Saturday came around and we had the dealer's room. This, uh, we, had, we had a couple of new vendors this year. Um, this was the first time that I, that I have seen uh, Chuck there. I think he would be one of the most notable with the... Every with at least three of everything you've never heard of still mint in package from G1 Japan. He had a really so, impressive booth. Like if you want to see things that, if you want to see things you can't afford, if you want to see four digit numbers on transformers, it was really impressive. The only booth that made RoboSend look cheap. It did. It was like the dollar menu over there. At RoboSend after seeing those prices. <laughs> And, so uh, I just want to I just want to clarify. We're not complaining about his prices. His prices are right. That stuff is just so damn oh, yeah, rare yeah. that it costs that much. He had he had not one G1 Minervas, but multiple G1 Minervas for sale. And for those of us who liked the character before she started getting more mainline toys, I think it's been a torture for years just of how much it cost and how rare it is. There were multiples. Yeah, I think it's we really had, impressive. Uh, yeah. Five grandis for sale. I believe so. Five grand each. Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. Rick or uh, no, sorry. Uh, Peter gave us a li gave us a list of things to ask him for prices on, and there was I was asking for items that I didn't even know what the hell they were. Like, okay, I need a price for whatever the hell this is, and this, and never heard of this guy. So, but it was very impressive. Chuck, Chuck, Absolute top, not top, top shelf stuff there. Yeah, Chuck is known for that stuff. I've known him since he was twelve years old. That's how well. And now he's a dad. Now he's a doctor, and he's a dad. You need to be a doctor if you want to buy those those toys. At I this know. Point. I'm, ma yeah, I'm married to a doctor, expensive. and I can't buy some of those toys. Yeah, Mint in it's G1 Japanese stuff. Yeah. Wow. Next yeah, it was wife. really cool. Next wife. Uh, three zero had a booth there for for the first time also. Uh, very very large, well dis very nice, well displayed, impressive. You know, I think Robo the, the had a big setup as well. Is, is they don't they don't have a lot of products, so they have this giant booth for not very many products. It reminds me of when Flame Toys has done booths. And it's like they have this giant, really well-made booth, and then they have one thing for sale. Three zero at least had like six things for sale. And there were at least three v different vendors, possibly more, that were all selling customs. 
which is fantastic to start seeing customs becoming a regular thing for sale. Less 3D some... printed stuff, though. I noticed that the, the last couple East Coast ones, there have been more 3D printed stuff. It was more customs and less 3D printed at this one. Mm-hmm. There were uh, there were one or two vendors who I thought, oh, I wonder if they knew what they were getting into because there was one that I saw that didn't have any Transformers and it was like, they had like keychains or something or they had like anime keychains, um, which is probably something, you know, you'd find to be very common at a California convention. So I wonder if there's, if one or two of those signed up not really knowing what it is they were signing up for. I don't know if you if uh, you noticed them at all. I did, yeah. Uh, I noticed. I noticed one like that. Yeah, this was actually inside the main dealer room, not not the side tables. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, I uh, I did picked up for myself. Uh, you know, there's there's not much shopping for me to do. Fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, and the uh, only thing I uh, ended up picking up for myself, besides the three uh, Zero figures, uh, I picked up some uh, Bakon Japan stuff. So I picked yeah. up, uh, finally, got a uh, really nice um, uh, Double Punch and Barbarian. Yeah, I was impressive to see that stuff there too. That's just really hard to come by. How was uh, Artist Alley? Artist Alley was fantastic. It, it usually is very good out here in California be, because we're allowed to have gay people out here. So I, I, I know I personally shop a lot, buy a lot of stuff from the Artist Alley because I love all like they do a lot of like the little acrylic things out here which are just fantastic i love the all, all the acrylic art um, what she held up as a ravage on a pumpkin it was very cute oh yeah um what, what was that uh, that things. uh bill you showed me the foil embossed bill uh that money repeat that the so what, what was that money. Uh, oh. uh, yeah the the money bill yeah those aren't actually artist alley items i think those are mass produced but they um there's only one vendor who has them um the one i have in close to me is not transformers but um it's a one piece bit one but um that vendor does a lot of the smaller cons all along the coast out here and i'll be seeing him this weekend he's eventually he is planning to do some uh g1 are um transformers of the of this of this style which is a really this is not terrible this is a thick plasticky material just very it's very satisfying tactile wise um but when he does g1 stuff i'll be sure to let people know because he's he did do uh, did have some uh rise of the beast characters on these on these monies um and they sold out right away Otherwise, it was just a lot of different other anime styles. So how would you say the diversity of items in Artist Alley is compared to, like, you know, Orlando or Baltimore? Or I guess in your guys' case, Baltimore, since, since Orlando was not in your cards. Uh, well, I mean, I'll I mention, think we have the best art now. Yeah, I'll mention uh, Orlando since I was there. That was, uh, that was mm -hmm. a whole separate dealer room. And uh, it was definitely, there are definitely more people in that Artist Alley area in Orlando than there were in California. Maybe, maybe even triple. Shopping or exhibiting? Shopping more or people exhibiting. shopping, Rick, or more people exhibiting? Oh, more, more uh, yeah, I'm sorry, more vendors. I would say, I would say maybe, okay, maybe two and a half times, maybe even three times as many vendors impressive yeah we have a great um, fandom for this sort of thing now one of the big draws this year was the 40th anniversary and all those voice actors and Catherine, you said you didn't really go to any panels besides the third party one did any of you make it to the voice actor panel 
No, I'm sorry. I'm I'm too. Uh, you know, when I walk through the convention, I'm just swamped by people. Uh, you know, adoring fans, uh, mother, some, sometimes married, sometimes single, and uh, I I very rarely have a chance to attend a panel. But I made a point to go to the panel. I mean, you did just say you like known certain fans since they were twelve, so. I could assume that when mothers are seeing you, they're they're swarming you to say, "Leave my yeah. child alone," uh, or stop taking pictures of my child. Uh, no, a lot of that. No, uh, or where I have you been, to to Dad? Panel, uh, but I, at this point, you know, I've been going to conventions for twenty years now, and I think, I I think I'm at the point where I, I'm not too interested in that. I was more interested this year. And getting aut- autographs, which was kind of a first for me, more being more interested in getting autographs and meeting some of the celebrities than to go to panels or to uh, buy buy toys. So, so let's throw this out there: what what kind of signing experiences did you all have? Obviously, Rick, you had several. You talked about with Frank Welker. Any other more notable ones? And then Catherine and Anna, same question: the two of you. Well, for autographs, I didn't get any, but. This year was all except for three C uh, Netflix Siege voice actors. Everyone was G one. Yeah, was mostly G one. But yeah. whereas in previous years you might have had some from animated. Last year we had Earthspark, which was amazing. Um, you had a variety, a mix of shows. But this year, well, and, you know, this year was a little more focused. Yeah, and David Kay, of course. Yeah, you you can do a whole convention with just David Kay and call it KCon. You uh, could. He's, he's got a few roles under. His yeah, head. he his he's line is very always well liked. Um, Extremely well liked. I, yeah, uh, I will say I I met a voice actor who uh, he uh, he is an older gentleman. I won't say his name, uh, but he's an older gentleman, and uh, he just kind of says whatever's on his mind. And you guys got along very there's, well. There's no filter. There's no... It made me feel uncomfortable at some point. So there's, yeah, no, no filter and uh, a strong grip, and he doesn't let you go. He shakes your hand. And he talks, and he doesn't let go until he's done talking. Now, you, you talked about David Mendelton. You, you met him and got his autograph as well? Yes, yes, I did. Did you uh, challenge I saved Frank him for to last. an arm wrestling competition? No, no, I asked him if he wanted to go fishing sometime. Uh, oh, that's a good one. Did you wear a hat and flip it around and say, it's like a switch? No. No, uh, but I did catch him smoking out in the parking lot. Uh, uh, for, for he those did have over-the-top stuff there. Like, he had some prints from over ah, the top. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, so I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm old. The, the, Catherine and Anna, I think you're giving me a little bit of amused look, so, so if, if, if I'm misreading that, I apologize. Uh, David Mendelton is... is uh, Mendenhall, I'm sorry, not Mendelhall. <laughs> David Mendenhall is sort of known for two things. Transformers the movie, the voice of Daniel, and playing Sylvester Stallone's son in an arm wrestling movie called Over the Top. Um, ah, so, okay. Yeah, and like, Sylvester Stallone was a truck driving arm wrestling champion, and like, his whole thing was like, as he would be like, in the middle of a match, and he'd like, to, to like, power up, he would turn his head backwards and that would give him the strength to, to, to win the arm wrestling match. Sure. Yeah. That, um, that's totally Anna and ours in my scene. It's the eighties. It's eighties logic. It's, it's a, such an eighties. I mean, like over the top fits that, that movie so perfectly. Um, so if you want to see a cheesy eighties movie, you know, please go ahead you know and watch what? it. It's, I'm going to have uh, to watch that tomorrow. I think it's got Terry Funk in it too. It, I always like to um, remind people that I was a maximum of six during the 80s. So a lot of these movies I don't really remember. I didn't see it till like 2004. So it, it was not something I was aware of during the 80s. Um, 
Anna, any uh, autographs or celebrity interactions on no, your side? No, I, I, the only person I interacted with was Jack Lawrence to get books for Lucas and Christian. So, so I get I get them books. He signed them. He was very nice and friendly. I don't really know people very well. So I'm a lot more shy around celebrities than you would probably expect from the way I act on the show. I just, I don't know. I get a little intimidated by not really knowing what to say. Like, I don't know how to small talk very well. They're just people. So all I could really do is be like, oh, let's rant about toys. And they, they don't care. So I know they're just people, but there has to be some sort of, I have to have more than just like small talk interactions. Like the year that um, Greg Berger was at TF Expo, I was asked to be the one to pick him up from the airport. And I did. And very quickly, you know, in just like this awkward small talk phase was very short for us because he was like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from St. Louis. He was like, me too. Next thing you know, we had things to talk about, right? We could talk about growing up in St. Louis. We could talk about liking St. Louis style pizza and everyone else hating it. And that was easy for me. But otherwise, I can't do, I can't do like the small talk unless I have some sort of topic to talk about. It just doesn't work for me. So I, I avoided celebrities for the most part. Like, I kind of, like, looked at them and said, oh, look, a person. And then I moved on. I, yeah, Jack Lawrence, um, he did Lost Light, correct? He did yeah. work on Lost Light. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like he's one that doesn't do a ton of conventions. Um, at least uh, not not the ones I've been able to attend. So that he would be... Uh, you know, if I had a little bit more budget, I'd, I'd have him on my list. Yeah, he had lost life in records Bibles with him. A little, oh, no. little softback book. Meanwhile, every time I saw cool. an elderly person, I kept turning to Anna saying, which voice actor is that? <laughs> and every time I would be like, why else would they be here with like? a patch? Um, all right, so Catherine, you mentioned the third party panel, and that's always a highlight of TFCon. That's sort of one of the things that put TFCon on the map a bit. So, so uh, what were your impressions with what you saw? This is the first year. Of, no, probably not the first, but this particular one, nothing caught me. That it just wasn't stuff for me. That, but you know, doesn't mean anything there was bad. However, if you are a fan of Iron Hide and Ratchet, boy, this was the panel for you. <laughs> not one, but two new masterpiece size. Iron Hide and Ratchet's coming out. Yeah, that's what X Transbots and Fans Toys each were showing their own. Yeah, and X Transbots one has been out for a little while, right? The pictures have been out for a little while, yeah. and people have been seeing it. They've been kind of mixed, you know. It's been like, I guess it's better than the MP as far as looking more accurate, but it's kind of messy and eh, whatever. And then then they show Fans Toys, and Fans Toys is just you know this perfect smooth Fans Toys nightmare of a toy. That you know is going to look wonderful on a shelf, but probably cause you to develop some sort of condition in your hands after transforming once. Very impressive, very neat looking. All I see yeah, is if I remember the X Transbots one, they showed it at Orlando in in one of the cases, and it was very much more focused, I think, on having like the sled um, that could detach, like the original G one toy, if I, if I remember accurately. Yeah, I don't know if it detaches or not, but it does have the sled. Yeah. Rick just uh, kind of pooped on us here. I didn't know what's going on there. So, yeah. Um, all right. I, I, this as far as they're pretty, that one, pretty reveals, you know, there, there was basically no legends, right? Um, they showed the DX9 Mini stuff off, but... That's been floating around its pictures. It was the same pictures we've seen online of their Chrome Dome that's coming and a little bit of a um the little bit of a tease for a Jinrai that they're gonna do, which is really cool. You know, they're they did um they did Clouder and now they're gonna do Jinrai. So that means they might actually make a small scale super god master force set, which is gonna break my heart after buying all those fans hobby figures. And be like, oh, now I can have them smaller? Oh, dang it. But, um, yeah, that was, like, the only Legends thing, really, right? They really weren't showing off the Legends. Um, MMC showed off stuff that we knew that they were going to be showing off. Um, they did have great models 
of their first couple of MMC constructed cons, um, which are actually quite large. So the Devastator is going to be bigger than the other combiners, which is a little surprising to me. Just that he's going to be big. Um, they're all in technology. It's still really impressive whenever they show it off in preview pictures. Um, they're really showing off a lot of the defense orgs. It looks like Hotspot's going to come out pretty soon. And um, yeah, that looks really cool. But as far as like things we didn't know were coming in the third party panel, there just wasn't a lot of that. We did see get to see in the in the display case in in the dealer's room a uh, a completed Leo Kaiser finally. Yeah, they did Leo Kaiser out there. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, the two arms were still grouped out with the uh, two torso pieces present and complete, and you know, those haven't shipped yet. I thought I, I remember, maybe this wasn't in the panel, I thought I remember seeing a, a um, uh, the King Toys, uh, uh, was it, Razor Claw, um, is finally, uh, they got that ready to go, the Legend Scale, one of that. No, no those, have been, those, are, those have been out for a while, that's completed on my shelf. Okay, okay, I apologize. The, the, the Legend Scale, not the big one, I know you yeah. got the big one. Yeah, oh, okay. I've, I've got maybe, both. Yeah, they're both done now. This. Yeah. All right. The last Razor Claw, the last one shipped and arrived. It, for me, it arrived uh, in early January. Okay. okay. They showed well, off they... Bird Face, right? From um, yeah, their next they showed, off, they showed off the MP size swoop. Their swoop ish okay. guy. Was it the first time they showed that off, or were those pictures already available online before? Already available. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so not a whole I, lot I of TFCon premieres. Yeah. When you were talking earlier about like the fact that there are three TF cons and how well attended they are, I will say that is one thing that I think that the multiple TF cons has, has suffered a little bit as the third party panels get diluted. Um, and, and some like fans hobby, they like to show their stuff off on their own social media channels. So it, it is just, uh, it's not the be all end all place of like, this is where you're going to first see all these uh, third party things coming out. So. Um, it's still, I'm sure, you know, fun panel. Yeah, we're a little too well connected Ooh. these days. It's just like, you know, today was one of the Thursdays in um, March. So it was another of the Hasbro streams. And once again, they showed off all things that had already been revealed in pictures. But it was still yeah. fun to watch it with a little bit of the theatricalness. And I think the third party panel is the same. Right, like even though we've already seen these things, it's still fun to be in a room with other people looking at them together, having them revealed in a little more theatrical of a way. Yeah. Rick, do you it, have any other uh, highlights you want to go over? It's a it's a bit of nostalgia talking about the third party panel, but third party I think is also just kind of maybe the interest is not there as much as it used to be. Um. Because, I mean, look, we have four different Masterpiece skins. So anything is possible. Any figure is possible. And now Hasbro can do Porsche. So Except not. It's, it's, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. No, I just think it's become part of... It's no longer a surprise, right? Like, third-party stuff no longer really surprises us because it's been around long enough and you know your your fans toys and your fans hobby and even to it to an extent your ex trans bots and kfc have been around doing well for so long that it's just kind of like let's see the next good figure from this group you know it's like fans toys is doing iron hide and ratchet okay yeah that's actually a really big deal but it doesn't feel like a big deal because there's going to be a fans toys reveal every year it's just gonna happen uh well yeah okay um uh i think we can move on to sunday so sunday i i had a little bit of a exciting day on sunday i got to host a panel uh for my friend mike k who uh got the Guinness World Record for transform largest Transformers memorabilia at 10,513, I think, figures or items. 
And so we did a uh, we did a panel explaining the whole process that you have to go through Guinness's you know way of doing things and how tedious it can be to make sure there's a hyperlink for each figure and show proof of retail and proof of availability. And uh, you have to be on screen counting the item with two witnesses who also have to be on screen submitting a spreadsheet that's in the same order as the video log. And it, it's, it's a very complicated thing. It, it was all about Mike's achievement. Uh, I'm coming for that record. It, uh, it's just a matter of motivation. So, uh, uh, congratulations to Michael K. And then at the end of the panel, I actually got to present to him uh, a the Guinness, the actual Guinness certificate for world's largest collection, which I had sent to me. I had framed it, brought it to California, and I actually got to present it to him. And then he had uh, Frank Welker and Peter Cullen sign it. Oh, wow. And uh, the way I, I framed it was I took uh, a black frame but then had metallic pinstripes around it. And one side in the corner had red, and then the other side had uh, metallic purple. And then the pens they used to sign were red and purple, which was just just perfect. Just oh, fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the pictures he took with it. It's really nice looking. It's really cool. Rick, some behind the scenes information I'd, I'd love to hear. How many hours approximately did it take him to go through all that? So I think what he said, they were counting on doing two days worth of counts where you sit in front of the camera and you hold each item up and you count it. And it ended up being closer to five days, I believe. And they ended up... But even then, you, you have to have like everything ready... To be like in at hand to pick it up and put it down. It's not like you can go like dig in a bin, pull this out, dig in a bin, right. pull this out. So it's like, yeah. so you have to have two witnesses who are uh, proven experts in the field sit with you to verify the count and be on film while you're counting each item. Then you have to have people on the side to open bins, hand you things, you hand them off after you count it to the other person on the other side. They take it, put it back into the box, into the bin, or, or wherever it's going. And it all has to be done in a certain order. Because you have to submit a spreadsheet that's in the same order as the count. So that's 10,500-some items that have to be done in a certain way, in a certain order. It doesn't, you know, you could do, hey, I'm going to start with Armada, and I'll save G1 for the end. That's fine. But if your spreadsheet says... Bumblebee, Kiff Jumper, Optimus Ratchet, you have to make sure it's in that order when you're when you're filming yourself counting things. It's a very difficult Does thing. Guinness and care? he definitely motivated me to get it done. I came home, said, All right, all right, I'm this is it. This is my year. I'm gonna do it. And that feeling's gone. But it took him, it took him a year from when he set out to do it a little over a year to, to get confirmation that he had broken the record. Wow. Does Guinness care at all if it's in package or loose? Well, we went through all the rules that Guinness set out. Uh, an in package version counts as one, a loose version counts as another, right? So I have hmm. here, you know, you know me, I love my sweeps, right? So I have 200 and, you know, 80 some sweeps loose out of the package. That counts as one. Okay. But then verifiable things like here's a sweep in the package counts as, as another, but here's a sweep with an autograph on it. That counts as another. So items like uh, the Unicron pillow I have, that's one. And prototypes count as one. And, and paper, paperwork to a degree counts as one. But the stuff like third party does not count whatsoever. Customs do not count. But commissioned art by people who worked on the brand does count. Hmm. And that's just the rules that Guinness, like a pair of earrings, right? They like go as a pair. So that's one. 
But if you have a headmaster, that's two characters in one box, that counts as one. And when you count the toy, oh, that's two toys because it's two different characters. That's I was literally about to ask that. I'm like, all right, what, let me think of a combiner or something. Like, all right, headmaster, target right. master. So, so out of package. So if you have a, a headmaster loose and a headmaster in package, you have three toys according to their, their no. rules. If you have a headmaster in package, that's two toys in one package. And then you have the okay. loose toy, that's two toys. Right? Okay. So Devastator is six toys. Devastator counts as five, as, as six toys, yes. Devastator counts as six, because it's six figures that make the toy. And if you have a gift set, that counts as six. Okay. And that's just, just, just the way Guinness does the rules. That's not Mike or me saying this is the way we're counting them. It all has to be done according to the Guinness rules. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes sense. Right. So if you have a DVD set and there's 10 DVDs in it, that counts as one, though. But a headmaster counts as two. Target master counts as two. Oh, that sounds thoroughly exhausting. It's and then, absolutely but then like horrible. A target master like Scoop would count yes. as three. And then you have to provide a hyperlink in your spreadsheet along with a picture. Not from you have to provide a picture of the item. So you, you film yourself collecting it uh, or counting it. Then you have to photograph everything, put all the photographs into your spreadsheet, explain what it is, put a hyperlink to show where it was commercially available or how it was be how it was obtained, and then you have to you have to include a picture of like a mass release item, like the same thing, right? So now think back to when Skybound did five hundred different covers for number one. Wow. That's why I'm not motivated. Now, Mike, Mike and then, a team player. Yeah, and some of those were like. And Mike's going to give me his spreadsheet. Or, not even retail exclusive. Yeah. Mike, Mike's a team player. We're friends. He's going to give me his spreadsheet so I can copy and paste a lot of stuff. But, I mean, I, I lost count in 1997. And I had over 7,000 items back then. And now my career. So when Mike decided he was going to go for the record, he he asked me not to go for it. He asked me if just if I could sit back and stand by while he does it. And I said, yes, of course. I, you know, I want you to get it. And then when the time's right and I have nothing happening in my life, Nothing left to when live I have for. nothing left to live for. I've achieved all my collecting yeah. goals. I worked at Hasbro. I got my toys in the Smithsonian. I wrote a book. This is the last goal for me. I got my Frank Welker autograph, my la my white whale. Getting that Guinness record is is the is the last step to world domination. Well, speaking of the last steps, we're we're getting you know close to ninety minutes here. Um, let me ask uh, each of you what what was your favorite thing you walked away from uh, from the convention in terms of purchases or or just acquisitions in general. Kiss players, I found glit for sixty dollars, the only glit in the showroom. And this is the MMC Doc Hat. Release of Glit, not the not the original Glit figure, which Catherine would be less excited about since the G1 set. Uh, That's fair. I, I'm happy I finally got the Double Punch and Barbarian from Box on Japan. Way overdue for me to get those. Way, way overdue. Yeah, I decided to finally start. Um, to start finishing my action masters, start going for the European stuff. So I went ahead and picked up Circuit because I found a good condition mm -hmm. one um, that looks nice. And yeah, I'm glad you're showing that. It's an Very important nice member paint. of the Wreckers. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> Very important record from Treads and Circuits. I also got Axer, funny enough, because in Treads of Circuits, Treads and Circuits are rivals in that one kills the other, but you know. Anywho, I was very happy to get him. He's in nice condition. And now I have to start getting the other European ones, which will be fun. But more fun to show off, honestly. Have fun with those action master elites. Yes. More fun for me is that I got a hold of this. This is a freaking KO G1 Grimlock combined with some skelly lizard skin looking stuff to kind of make him sort of kind of Godzilla-ish. And he's also got hands that you can put up in front of his face in an oh no expression. And he's wearing a scarf, um, which was a gift from a friend. But this thing is amazingly stupid and I love it. And I was so lucky to find it because it is kind of hard to find this particular KO um, in decent condition. And this one's in decent condition. So I was very, very happy to get it. Can I see the Stegosaurus? Can I see the Stegosaurus? Yes, somebody stole it for me. I have to walk to it. All right. Anna uh, and, and Catherine and Rick were, were sending uh, in the text uh, chain for the cast some of their acquisitions throughout the weekend. And Anna found this thing, and I was just. Uh, for those of you who've, who've watched the show before, I, I enjoy dinosaurs quite a bit. And this is... That, oh, my God. That looks... That is fantastic. So, I looked at that thing, and to me, it looks like there's two souls trapped in one body. There's the Stegosaurus soul, which is just... It has that expression of shock. Like, it's getting, like... Like, it's visiting the proctologist by accident. <laughs> And then it's got the very cool uh, Earl Norum robot head. So, little known fact, this is actually a prototype for Studio Series Snarl. <laughs> it looks like if you would just show me that and, like, hid the kibble with your hands and the fist down there, like, oh, that's a great looking, like, 90s, early 90s, late 80s era, like, dinosaur toy. Like that looks straight out of a museum yeah. gift shop. Yes, exactly. And it's like the, the colors are just so garish and amazing. And then it just, the, the robot mode that you show us is like such, again, that like 80s, just like, like, um, like, like not third party and not knockoff, but like the, the it's sub fourth party that you'd find. Fourth yeah, party. No, not, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm blanking now if like, they had the insects and the birds and and, and, and some of that stuff. Converters, yes! It has such a converters feel to it. Thank you so much, Catherine. It has such a converters feel. In the, the, yeah, it's like if you made like a Dino Rider converter, like that's what that toy is. It is hideous. It is wonderful. I really do like it. I would happily show everyone the robot mode too. I've already taken pictures of it and put it on the Discord. I will post them on the TFYLP Facebook page as well because I don't know if I'm going to transform this thing ever again in my life because it's so hard to move the joints. Like, oh, it's not a yeah. particularly difficult transformation. It's actually kind of clever. It's got some neat things going on on it for what it is. It ends up with Stegosaurus spines as a chest, which is not so pretty, but it also ends up with some really cool Nova Prime style wings, which is really amusing. But good grief, getting these joints to move is just like trying to get back into dinosaur mode so I can put it in my luggage was a nightmare because the joints and the legs just would not move no matter what I did to it. I was like beating it on a table, yelling at it. <laughs> yelling didn't work. It was quite painful, but I love it. It's great. It's absolutely hilarious. I got two amazing KOs. So between this and the the Godzilla looking deuter. They are amazing. Yeah, you, your haul, Anna, I have to admit, I'm very, very jealous of. Catherine, your, your haul is very cool looking too, from what I saw. The banner and the third party stuff is great. And Rick getting that getting that poster finish is outstanding. Uh, but but the the European action master and the the two dinosaur toys, I'm just like, 
And just so you oh, know how big this scene is, right? The scene is humongous. It is not small. I just love all the colors. Like when you're holding both those toys up, it's just like, oh, oh my paradise. Eyes it's love so it. good. I love it. It was a lot of fun. It's funny because I was I was sitting around kind of in the room after getting all this stuff thinking about like what am I gonna play with out of this stuff? Because it's like you don't really play with this, you don't really play with old action masters. But gosh, they're such cool gets, right? They're really cool things to have. Wow, thank you very much. So it, it sounds like you all three enjoyed yourselves. Sounds like you'd all three recommend TFCon LA. I know you guys have lobbied hard for other members of the cast to come out and join you. Um, any other highlights or takeaways before we wrap up for the evening? I, I would really like everyone to try to go next year. I do want to go next year. Um, again, I think it would be fun to continue to go every year. I will say that if you've never attended a TFCon before, just be mindful of how much time you spend in the dealer's room because we were talking about how Catherine and I didn't really go to panels and that wasn't really a choice I made. That was really a like, Oh, I'm going to start circling around the dealer's room one more time at two o'clock and then it's six and it's closing. And I like, just like, I've even looked at everything yet because it is just an, like when you go to a dealer's room at your comic con or your anime convention or whatever, right? There's a few vendors that have the things you want. There's a few toy vendors or there's a few artists that do the things you like or whatever. And you ignore like 75% of the vendors, if not more. But when you go to a Transformers convention, when you go to TFCon, 100% of the vendors are interesting to you. And almost all of them are also fans who can actually talk about the products they're selling. So I had several situations where I would just pick something up, start talking about it, and then the person selling it would be like, blah, 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 and I'd be like, blah, 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 and then 45 minutes had passed, and we were just blah, 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 at each other. And so much time can pass in that dealer's room, and you'll miss panels, you'll forget to eat, you'll do all sorts of things you shouldn't do, so just be careful at your first day of time. Yeah, most conventions don't have windows, so it's like Las Vegas that you have no idea what time of day it is. You lose your sense of time and place and everything. But I think a number of us are going to Baltimore, so um, that'll be another con to go and hang out to. I don't know if I'm going yet. I say that as if I think I'm going, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can budget the time. But um, yeah, that one will be fun, and that one will probably have room parties. I have a different take on this. I don't recommend anyone else coming to L.A. Keep it for the elite cool kids. Oh. I see I, uh, the, the West Coast snobbery has reared its head. I don't like any of you guys, so. And more coastal elitism coming from Rick in the east side of the right. town. Y you're, you're, you guys mean nothing to me. I, might, I was actually thinking about leaving this show and joining another podcast. Oh. Well, I mean, so sad. you saw after one guy left the show and he had a third party toy named after him, then, then you know, you're like, you just want that kind of, you know, stardom. Oh, I, just, you know, toy. I don't know. I don't know if my ego is actually that big. Yeah, I was going to recommend mm -hmm. it be a unicron repaint and we name it Rick. That would be a big ego. They, I was hoping they'd name a figure Galvarez. Oh, wow. That's. Yeah. yeah. That, that sounds cool. Yeah, he's got, you know, he's got a, re it's just Galvatron, but he's got like a receding hairline, like the little horns on his head are like, kind of like, kind of like falling. To it can the be side. the Galva you can be the Galvatron with the unicorn, with the unicron body. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just the, the slumped shoulders. <laughs> Rick just, just, just the total defeat that that Catherine just laid upon Rick's feet was was fantastic. I'm not every. <laughs> I was gonna say he he reminds me more of like the the Unicron prototype, um, <laughs> the that a Super Seven just made a toy of. He's going here, gosh, guy. Wow. <laughs> So that was all on my brain. The last Dr. episode just of Rick's putting that toy out. Rick's TFYLP. 
<laughs> we kid because we love to kid. He Rick. does for me mean poop faces. All right. Uh, book club coming up this weekend. What what you talking about, Anna? 20 some odd. Issue 20 something of IDW Reboot Universe. The best Damn. of all of the comic book runs. We just I, hit the half year mark on the new Skybound uh, series, and that's that's been enjoyable. So uh, I yeah, issue six it. just happened to that. If you want to read a complete first story, it's now out. Yeah. Ooh, I, I wonder who Optimus kills in this issue. Yeah, I did cut the tape last week, but I guess Lucas didn't care enough to put it up. Lucas is on vacation, hence why I'm here. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Well. Uh, for those of you, I, yeah, I, I guess eventually cut the tape will be on again. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I um, really wish we would have done and cut the tape together at the con. Uh, we talked about it. Yeah, I've never had, a, I've never had a guest on cut the tape other than my kids. I would have been a, ga- a great guest. I would have judged you for how yeah, it would have been those like little Martha, blind box figures were. Yeah, it would have been like Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg together, but Anna and Rich. <laughs> Yeah, just like that. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you everyone Anna for joining us tonight on uh, TFYLP. And yeah, come back next week. And uh, yeah, if those of you who wanted to post comments, feel free to do so. Hit that like, hit that subscribe, tell your friends. If you're new because you saw Anna at TFCon, uh, thanks for joining us. If you're old, uh, you know, viewer, thanks for sticking with us. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again next week.